everybody. I'd like to thank the entire TED committee of FLAME for uh, giving us this opportunity of speaking on this platform. Because ever since I began this research in the year 2010 of the origin of this uh, Indian script Devanagari, I really felt that this is one topic uh, which every Indian needs to know and uh, people in the world also need to know because it takes us back to the roots of our culture of this country, India, to unveil how ancient the tradition of our uh, country is. So before I begin, I'd like to ask the class, how many of us have ever asked our teachers, why do we write A or B in a particular manner or even O, R, E, the Indian language in a particular manner in the class? You all have asked your teachers in class when you were children, that's a good thing. But we didn't, uh, I never asked my teachers and then when I started teaching this subject of calligraphy and typography, uh, the word intrigued me, Devnagri. Because when we think of the English script, Roman per se, it is very logical for us to put two and two together and figure out that this particular script must be having some connection to Rome. But what intrigued me about the word Devanagari is the word itself. It's made up of two words, prefix called Deva, which literally means gods in the Indian context and Nagari means a place or a vicinity. And I was very curious to figure out from which vicinity of gods have these letter forms originated. And that is what led to this research, which I shall unveil. And I shall be taking you uh, through a visual journey of uh, stories. Uh, which tell us about the origin of this particular script called as Devanagari. Incidentally, 15 different languages in India are, writ are written by this one single script. So say for instance, the mother of all languages Sanskrit uses this script to be written. Hindi, the national language of India, Marathi, the state language of Maharashtra and Nepali, Pali, Avdi, Bhilli, Bihari, so, so on and so forth. So 15 different verbal languages and one single script and these are the different perspectives of the origin of this particular script. So for those who are not aware, this is the way the vowels are written in this particular uh, script and uh, these are the way the consonants are written in this script. Now in any country you go, you see the uh, Trojan column or you see the Chinese letter forms, you see the Egyptian letter forms, you see the culture of that particular uh, country reflecting through the letter forms and what comes out uh, through the Indian letter forms also is the culture of this particular country India. And not until 5000 years ago when the Harappan and Mohenjo-daro seals were uh, excavated and discovered, the whole world took notice of India having a script 5000 years ago. But today I shall be taking you to an era even before that to figure out what was the script or what was the thought behind the letter forms in the ancient times. So there are two schools of thought primarily, one is the mantra perspective and the other is the tantra perspective. Mantra is the way uh, knowledge was imparted during those times, so it was a very verbal way wherein the teacher or the guru verbally dictated whatever he had to say because paper was not invented and then students or the shishyas uh, repeated, ex repeated it exactly in the same manner. So that was a mantra way, methodology of teaching and the next one when the visuals also were added to the verbal uh, teaching process that is the tantra perspective. So we shall be looking at both these schools of thought which have got very interesting mythological stories and which take us back to the Vedic times of India. So the first story goes in Kashika Sutra and I shall read out the shloka for you which is in Sanskrit and then tell you the interesting story behind this particular shloka. So the shloka goes and takes us back to a god Shiva of a very well known god of the Indian culture and the shloka says Nritta sane Nataraja Raja Nanada Dhakkam Navapanchavaram Uddhartu Kama Sanakadi Siddhan Etadvi Marshe Shiva Sutra Jalam. So the story goes like this that one day when Lord Shiva uh, takes a pause after his thunder, his dance and a sage, Sanak, who was observing that dance approaches the Lord and says, Oh God, is there any mechanism wherein we can ensure that all the shlokas and the amount, the treasure of knowledge that we have today can reach the 21st century and times thereafter? 
so the god lord shiva is very pleased with the question that at least one sage one of my devotees is concerned about uh, preserving the knowledge which we have today in those times and in his happiness he plays his musical instrument called as the damru and he plays it 14 times now as we know sound and visuals form are inseparable and they are made of uh, vibrancies frequencies and the sage this sage sanak he sees certain forms when that damru the musical instrument is played and the forms which the sage sees are crescents so what you see in the center line are the 14 rows of the crescents seen by the sage sanak when lord shiva plays his musical instrument a damru and eventually the letter forms which uh, evolved over the years are given in the left and the right column uh, represents the roman letter forms uh, in order to enable us to understand now today the script which we use has got some relevance to that of panini he was a grammarian and just now i was speaking about lord shiva excuse me so what is the transition that happened from lord shiva to the grammarian panini so there is another shloka in the indian uh, uh, culture which says Uh, which depicts this entire process in a metaphorical manner and it says samudravata vyakranam maheshwara tadartha kumbodharanam bruhaspatav tad bhagasya shatam purandare kushagra bindut patiti panini so what happens in this is the grammar which lord shiva predicted was vast as an ocean and it was impossible for any human mind to comprehend and understand it so there was another grammarian bruhaspati who reduced it to the size of a pitcher there came another grammarian indra who thought even that is too large and people are just not going to follow it so he reduced it to 100th of a picture and then came panini who reduced it to a small droplet falling from a thin blade of grass so this has been metaphorically described in this particular shloka so that is what we follow today in india through this particular script now come the design discoveries of this script which are based on a circle Another shloka states that akhanda mandala karam vyaptam yena characharam, which means the radiance of the sun permeates the entire universe. And we see the sun as circular, as a circle, and that's the reason why probably a circle or a sphere must have been taken as the basis of the letter forms. And all the letter forms in Devanagari are created by either bisecting or trisecting a circle. So you can see the sun to the extreme uh, right hand side, and you can see the letter forms to the left hand side. And I'm talking only of the violet crescents which you see. I haven't come down to the vertical line or the headline which you see. So the crescents are formed by bisecting or trisecting the circle. I do not think there is any other script in the world which is so strong as far as as its design goes as the Devanagari script from India. So in in this slide you can see to the extreme right hand side you can see the spheres and you can see the crescent which which is dominant in the entire horizontal line in 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 the chart. further on the grammarians also made things very simple for a student to understand how are you going to pronounce these letter forms uh, of the indian language so they identified five different points in our uh, mouth from which you can chant and i can tell you how exactly you have to utter this letter form so say for instance at the base of our vocal cords you say this is my gut feeling and you have uh, the guttural and the letter forms in the first line are called as a gutturals because you utter them from the base of your vocal cords so they are prana- pronounced as k k g g g and the last line say labials so wherein your lips meet so it is p p b b m so you have a very clear understanding so this is these are the labials and these are the gutturals and these are the dentals and so on and so forth so five dis- distinct categories were made for all the consonants to enable students to understand and comprehend the way you need to utter the uh, consonants now we come down to understanding what is the relevance of having a vertical line in all the letter forms again going back to the ancient vedic texts it is believed that all the letter forms are half or halanta so when you when you uh, pronounce them you pronounce them as ka ka ga that is the uh, half way of pronouncing them and not un- until you add the vowel a or a does it become complete so you have half ka and plus a which becomes ka that's how you pronounce it and this vowel a is has so much of importance it is represented by a vertibar and you see the relevance in two religious hindu texts 
One you see is in, see it in Ganpati Atharva Shirsha, which is in reverence of Lord Ganesha, wherein you read this line, Akaro Madhyama Rupam, that means I am Akar and I am Madhyam, that means I am central to the entire script written. And the second reference comes in the Bhagavad Gita, 10th chapter, 33rd shloka, wherein you have Lord Krishna telling Arjuna, Aksharanam Akarosmi, in all the letter forms, I am Akar. So you cannot chant a single, you cannot utter a single word without taking my name. So that tells us about the inclusion of this cosmic energy into the creation of the Indian script. And this particular uh, vowel A uh, is represented in the form of a vertical line, a vertibar, which has got three methods or three ways of representation. The first one which you see in the yellow squares is the mid bar for the letters K and F. The one in the blue squares is the end bar, so you see the vertical line to the end. And the one in the green are the top bars wherein you see the vertibar on the top of the letter forms. So all the consonant, consonantal curves are attached to the vowelic vertibar in some way or the other. But these three uh, consonants, G, N and SH, which form the name of Lord Ganesha, uh, do not have the consonantal curve touching the vowelic vertibar. To, in order to show that this cosmic energy is a part of existence, but yet it is way above. And that is the reason why this particular script is also known as Ganesh Vidya. And the last line is inclusion of the vertibar or the horizontal line on top. The reference is found in the 100th chapter of Padma Puran, another Vedic text which says that sarvakshare shiro rekha avakra pranavam vina. Except for the divine syllable om, all the letter forms in this particular script will have a horizontal headline. And that is the reason why a horizontal line is always uh, added on every Devanagari letter form. With this we come to an end of the mantra perspective and we shall just take a glimpse into the tantra perspective where along with Shiva to the left hand side we also have his consort Parvati. And rather than drawing the entire human figure of a male and a, a female figure, we have it graphically represented in the form of spheres. So the left hand side you have Shiva, which is supposed to be the throb of the whole universe, Spandan in Sanskrit or the throb of the whole universe. And Parvati is the Shakti or the energy required to sustain that throb. So together the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere form make a sphere or a circle. And this philosophy believes that all the letter forms beginning from uh, vowel a uh, to consonant h uh, have been created by the explosion of this particular bindu or a uh, circle. The iconogra iconographic representations also state that every letter form has got a goddess associated to it and there were shlokas or hymns written in the praise of every letter form. And that is the reason why having a knowledge of these letter forms was considered to be very, very sacred in the country. So here are just a few slides to show you how every letter form has got a goddess associated and shlokas written in reverence of the, de of the letter form. These, these letter forms like Lru are no longer taught in the Indian education system, but the charts show us that once upon a time, hundreds of years ago, these particular letter forms existed. Yeah. And the last school of thought is that which originated in the 11th century of the Ishana Shiva, Guru, Shiva Gurudeva Paddhati. And it speaks about the concept of the pen being mightier than the sword, wherein all the letter forms were categorized according to the gate of these five birds. It is very difficult for us living in metros to imagine what would be the gate of a peacock or a swan or a duck because we are so much away from nature that it is difficult for us to believe. But in those days, people lived in sync with nature, so it was probably easier for them to imagine this. And you had these five birds like uh, the eagle, swan, duck, owl and the peacock and uh, uh, letter forms were classified according to the gate of these five birds and the letter forms which did not classify according to the gate were separated which you can see at the base and they were termed as pakshikara vihina. So that means they were away from and they did not uh, represent the gate of any of the birds. So this was the last one. It is also interesting to note through these charts in the first 10th and 20th century, according to the different settlements in the country, based on the crescents, 
how all the letter forms how all the scripts in india have evolved whether it is east india south india west india or northern india based on these crescents the scripts have evolved according to the way uh, people have imagined the scripts so these are further charts showing you the progression or the transitions in the scripts so this is what we saw today we saw the mantra perspective and the tantra perspective the mantra perspective takes us to prehistoric or the vedic times which in sanskrit is said to be the apavrushya we do not know in what century it is and the tantra perspectives come much later from the 6th century onwards and if you compare these two charts you can see say for instance the crescents the number of crescents vary for both for both the letter forms so say a letter u in mantra has got just one crescent whereas in tantra has got three crescents so you see that both the schools of thought are definitely different another observation very interesting is when you compare this entire chart of the devanagari script to the roman script you see many gaps in the roman script and that's the reason why we have to by heart english spellings say for instance psychology or q it is not exactly the way you pronounce it but that doesn't happen in any of the indian languages you write exactly the way you pronounce it and that's the reason why we never have to by heart any of the words when it comes to an indian script but for roman you do and to conclude i'll say that the entire presentation is based on dogmas the religious texts unless and until you have something like cymatics or physics to validate uh, the sound of the damru and the visual scene with that this research could have uh, greater credibility and validity thank you